We're starting in a new series today. Um, it's a, a series which um, I feel is really timely for us, particularly thinking of um, the, the world that we're living in with all the cost of living crisis and the, uh, the, the way that people are worried, are concerned, uh, fearful. Uh, there's much concern um, all over this country and in fact all over Europe about the way things are. And um, so it's, um, you know, the world scene has changed for us, hasn't it, in so many ways. And so um, I felt that it was right for us to do a series on finances. Um, we as a church, we are wanting every single one of us to be healthy. We want to be physically healthy, mentally healthy, healthy in our relationships. Uh, we want to be healthy in our, in our workplace. Uh, we want to be healthy in every aspect of our, of our lives. And um, one of the things that we started this year was our Destiny uh, 252, which is um, <clears throat> about being physically healthy, and we kind of encourage each other to be active and eating the right things and to be focused in the right way. Um, so, but, but today I just want to talk, I'll commence the, the series um, on finances because finances is a crucial area to every single one of us. And, uh, and, and I believe if we can get it right in this area, it is probably one of the most fundamental areas in our life that if we can get this right, then it will help us in every other area. In fact, one of the things about statistics is that many divorces, um, I can't remember what the, the, the rate is, but it's a very high rate that divorces happen because of arguments over finances. So if we can get the finances right, it is going to help your relationships. It is going to help you to not to worry and not to, to have concerns. Um, but it, it is going to be, it's a spiritual activity. It, it, it requires faith. It requires us to put the principles that God has placed in his word into our life. And so we're going to look over this series, particularly at Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. But today I want us to look at Matthew 25. Um, it is key to us. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about finances, I just want you to be aware that I'm aware that there are three responses when we talk about finances. The first response is that, that for, for those of you that are amongst us and those listening on site, there are, there are those that actually have already got this sussed, already kind of on board. Uh, they, they understand the dynamics, the principles of it. They're living it out and, uh, and can testify to that. So today is not for you. Yeah, it's a reminder, but it's not particularly for you. There are, there are those, in, I find, in every, uh, every setting, there are those that it doesn't matter what I say, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Um, they're going to either argue it away, or they're going to, because of often, because of their own issues in their life, um, they don't want to take this on board. And, uh, and so this is not for them neither, okay? But there's a third grouping of people, and that's for those who have never really heard about it, don't understand the principles, um, and, uh, and are eager to learn and want to take it on board. So this series is for you guys that really think if you would get the understanding, without the understanding, without the knowledge, we can't put things into practice, but once we do know, we have then the choice as to whether or not we actually uh, apply those principles. Unless you apply a principle, it's not going to work for you. But it is in the application of that that really matters. And so <clears throat> this week, I want us to talk about the foundation of financial help, about the finance, financial aspect. So we'll go into other aspects Oh, look at that. Oh, he's found a different one. That is very kind of him, isn't it? There you go. Thank you. I forgot to bring it down with me. Um, uh, but uh, it's not the one that I had planned on. But um, it, uh, it's better. It's posh. It's posh. Not like uh, I am. So, 
So, so I'm going to talk, obviously, about financial, financial aspects over these next few weeks. But I want us to realize that, actually, that this is not just um, a subject among many subjects, that this is probably one of the number one subjects um, that we can ever teach on as a church. For the simple reason, Jesus had a lot to say about it. In fact, out of the parables and the stories that, that Jesus said, over 50% of them talk about material possessions, about our money. And, um, and so there's more about finances than there is about heaven and hell. And so it's important that we address this subject, that it's not just left uh, to, to kind of for people just to read about it and to make assumptions about it. It is important that we actually uh, do that. And so it is important. I think one of the reasons that it's important for is because we spend most of our time thinking about money. <laughs> We're trying to think about how to save money, how to get money, how to spend the money, how to invest the money, whatever it is, we think a lot about money, don't we? And so it is important that we look at this. Now, <clears throat> of course... If at any point through this teaching, you, want, you get so excited. Miracles happen, you know. <laughs> you get so excited that you can, I'm happy for you to say amen. Praise the Lord. Or, do you know what I mean? And say, say it again, pastor, or whatever it might be, yes. Um, I'm happy with interaction. And if you don't like it, I'm happy with that because I will have <laughs> But, it, but it's important for us to actually to realize that, that I can say what I'm going to say, but it's really the receptivity of your hearts and minds that really matters. Because I'm going to talk about Matthew 25 and bring some of the scriptures, and I know that the Word of God is powerful. It is able to really penetrate into the very depths of our heart, into our beings, into our souls, to the very parts that even Heineken can't reach. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you remember those adverts. That's a while ago, isn't it? Yes. But uh, Matthew 25 is the parable known as the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. Now, <clears throat> um, a talent is actually a measurement of money. Now, I know we often use talent to express our abilities, our gifts, and, and many other things uh, that, that, that we have. And it applies to them but it's primarily about finances. And this parable is about the talents, which is money. Now, <clears throat> a talent was a specific weight of gold. And it, it, so if you think today, an ounce of gold is about 1,500 pounds. One ounce, yes? And a talent was um, 71 pounds in weight. So I'll let you do the calculations uh, for a little minute in your head. But it was a weight of gold. It was, there was a Babylonian talent, there was a Roman talent, and there was a Greek uh, talent, which was a specific amount of money. <clears throat> and Jesus tells this story of a wealthy businessman that's going to go on a long trip and he's going to be way out of the country for a long while. So what he wants to do, he gives these three servants of his some, some of his money for them to look after while he's gone, knowing that at some point he's going to come back and he's going to say to them, how did you do with, with what I gave you? Have you looked after what I've given you. And so he goes on this long trip. Now, you've got to remember, there weren't any banks in those days, so it wasn't like he could put it into the Yorkshire Building Society or something like that, or the Skipton, or whatever it is. Um, it was, it was uh, the only way, he, he, he was kind of cash in the bank, cash in, in his household, or it would be in goods. Um, it would be in some kind of thing, it might be in his house, it might be in whatever, but they had to have somewhere, they didn't, have uh, banks at the times. And so that's what this story is about, these two guys, uh, these three guys, sorry. Two guys get a good report when he returns, and one guy gets a bad report when the owner um, and the businessman returns. And out of this 
story, we are going to learn that there are seven foundational principles upon which we need to build our finances. Yes, to base our life on. Verse 14 says this, the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus talking, will be like a man going on a journey and he called his three servants together and he entrusted his property to them. How many servants were there? Three, okay. Now whose money was it? Was it the master or was it the servant? It's the master's, isn't it? Yes, so he's, he's not giving them it, he's loaning it to them. Yes, they are to be stewards, they are to be managers. Stewardship is, <clears throat> is an old-fashioned term. We would say managers today, a more modern term, means exactly the same. And so you and I are called to be stewards. We are called to be managers of what God has given us. So we are to be managers of the time that God gives us, of the finances that he gives us, of the relationships that he gives us, of the opportunities that he gives us. He gives us so many things in so many ways, and it's up to us to manage that wisely. That's what this parable is all about. <clears throat> and so the first principle that we get from this is the principle of ownership, that everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. In other words, it's not your money. And I know for some of you, you're saying, well, but Jonathan, I worked for it. I took the opportunities given to me. I got it wherever. I want to say to you, who gave you the physical ability to work? Who gave you the mind to be able to think of ways to be able to make money? Who is the one that gave you all the gifts and the abilities and the opportunities and the experience and the, and, and, you know, however it is in your life, it hasn't come without God's involvement. Yes, because he created us and made us so that we could look after ourselves and make some wise decisions. So our mind, our energy, everything that we have, our intelligence comes as a gift from God. It is on loan from God. And so often, though, we get into this, I own it, not that it's loaned to us. And so I believe that this is important. You see, I, when I came into this world, I didn't bring anything with me. And when I leave this world, there is not going to be a removals van in the process. Yes, there's not going to be a removals hearse going, he's taking everything with him. I tell you what you take with you. Nothing. And it doesn't matter who you are, you take nothing with you. And the issue is, the things when we come into this world, the things that we acquire in this world, the things that, that, are, that, that are, we're able to use and, and uh, enjoy in this world, are things that so often many people have enjoyed before us, and we get to enjoy them, and then people will enjoy them after us. Yes? Our parents made provision for us so that we could be good, and we hopefully we'll make wise provision, uh, uh, provision for our children. It's biblical to make provision for your children. Yes, I'm just letting my mum and dad know. Make sure they're just in that, you know. Listen closely. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's important, this. The ownership principle is so important for us. It is the essence of all things, because unless you grasp this one, the rest of it doesn't matter. Because so often we think it's ours, don't we? Yeah. Now, if you want to know whether you think it's yours or not, or whether you think you're the owner, or whether God's the owner, let me ask you about it. Do you worry about your finances? Because worry is a sign that you don't see yourself as a steward, but as an owner. And so often we do that. And, and we do it all the time. So let's say, for example... That, uh, that you have a wonderful holiday home um, on the coast, and you go away, and you say to me, Jonathan, uh, I'm going away, uh, we're going to go to, uh, to, to Germany or Spain or whatever, and we're going to, to live there for a year, and we'd like you to be able to use our holiday home while we're away. So, of course, being a Yorkshireman, I'm always going to take advantage of that, yes? So you can imagine Kath and I, uh, we're away, we use this holiday home whenever we can. And then a year later, 
yes, um, you phone up and you say, oh, we've, we're loving it so much here, uh, we've decided to stay for another year, and we kind of go, oh, what a shame. So we use it for another year, and then of course at the end of that year, what do they do? They phone up and say, look, we are enjoying it so much here, and of course a third year goes on. Let's say after three, three years, Kath and I are beginning to think, it's ours, because we've got so used to it now, we've had it for a few years, and it's, yeah. But then of course you phone up after four years and you go, oh, we're coming home, and I go, you what? It's ours, we're used to it, I mean, we use it all the time, you can't just come back, It's ours. And that, unfortunately, is how we treat the things that God gives us. He loans us to them, and, uh, and, we, and we treat them as if it's all ours and not his to look after. And so it is important for us uh, to do that. In Matthew 25 and verse 15, and I think this is an important thing to remind ourselves every day, yes, that, that we are managers of what God has given us. Yeah, if, you can, if we can grasp this on a daily basis. Verse 15 says, To one servant he gave five talents of money. To another he gave two talents of money. To another he gave one talent of money. So as we said, an ounce is 1,500 pounds. So does anybody know how much is 71 pounds for a talent? Anybody calculated it, got you onto Google and got the thing out? No? Okay, I'll tell you, it is 1.7 million pounds. So the one talent guy gets 1.7 million pounds, equivalent about, it wasn't pounds then, of course, it was in gold. That's what, that's what it was worth. Anybody here want to be a one talent guy? <laughs> Lord, bring it on. Yes, a one talent, yes. So can you imagine if you're the five talent guy? The five talent guy goes 8.5 million pounds in equivalent. That's not too bad, is it? The two talent guys are 3.4 million. I don't think that's bad. And I wanted to say the illustration that Jesus is trying to make here is God has made an investment in you and I. And his investment in you and I is very worthwhile. It's not like when I read the talents, I think to myself, oh, he gave them a quid each. Or he gave them a fiver each. Or he gave them a hundred pound each. Or he gave them something that, that's not really worthwhile. I want to say to you, this was very worthwhile having. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I think that's quite a, a, a great thing. Now, the five talents... Uh, the, sorry, the, the five talents is given to one, two talents is given to another, and one talent is given to the. What do we get from this? What's the principle? It's the second principle, the principle of allocation, yes? In other words, that God has loaned us money, yes? We don't own it, um, but he loans us for however long we live, whether that's 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, whatever it might be, you don't take it with you. Now, the issue is, is everybody gets a different amount. I know you're saying, if you, if you like me, you're saying, but that's not fair. The issue is, is God gives to each of us, and you only have to look around to realize that we are not all equal in our financial finances, are we? Some people are just better at getting finances. Some people have got that talent and that ability. Some people are in business and they can, they, can, they, can, they can make money like it's going out of fashion, yes? So the issue is, is we're all different, but the, the, the issue is, is whatever we are given, the choice is for us to invest it. So we might not have a choice over what we get given, but we do have a choice on how we use it, how we invest it, what we do with the money that's, that, that, that we're given. The issue is, is that everybody gets something. There's, an, there's nobody that gets nothing. We all get something, yes? And when that, you look at that something, that something is precious. That something is worthwhile, yes? And so, of course, <clears throat> in verse 16, it says, The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more talents of gold. So the one with two talents also doubled his money. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and just hid his master's money. The issue is money is a tool to be used. Yes? 
It's not to be buried. It's meant to be put to work. Let me just say this. We need to use money and love people. When we get that the wrong way around and we love money, what happens is we end up using people. So it's important that we love people and realize money is there to be used. Yes? And they get the use the right way around. Yes? Because when we love money, it starts to change our perspective and our priorities in life. I know some of you say, but isn't money the root of all evil? Well, actually, if you read uh, what the Bible has to say in 1 Timothy 6, it says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, it's not money, it's the love of money. It's when that's what becomes your God, when it becomes the thing that you're pursuing from that. So in other words, money is neutral. It's not good, it's not bad. It's, you can use it for good, you can use it for bad. So in other words, if you think of uh, uh, Putin, you realize that he's using it for evil. Yes, he's using money and it's, uh, his, his, his lives are being destroyed, countries being obliterated. He's causing cavoc, ca, uh, uh, havoc, sorry, havoc all over uh, of Europe and around the world. There is havoc as a result of this man, how he's using money. But you know what? Money is used for good. People that invested in this. Uh, a local multimillionaire invested in this place and invented, invested in many churches. I want to say to you, that's a good use. When we invest in the kingdom of God, in getting people into heaven, helping the homeless, whatever it might be, when we use it for those things, we can So money is, is, is not good, it's not bad. It's how you use it that makes the difference to it. It is just a um, neutral thing in us. So we've got to put our money to work uh, for us. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at that and uh, we're going to look at how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt and, and, um, and how we can make our money uh, work for us. Unfortunately, for too many people, they work for money rather than making their money work for them. And there is a, a big difference in that. So we're going to learn that, learn how to put our money to, to work. And so if you're stressed about money, you know that money is your master, not your slave. Money is a great servant, but it is a really tyrant of a boss to have when you're doing that. So <clears throat> these three servants, two, two go out and invest the money, one goes out and buries it uh, and hides it in the ground. And so it's important that we realize that we get to choose what we do with what God gives us, even though we don't get to choose what we are given. Yes? And we often compare, don't we? We compare, I think, you know, it's easy to compare. We'll look at them, you see, they've, they've got that kind of house and they've been able to get this and they've got that skills and they think, and the background they had and the heritage that they've got and, and, and they, they just got this money easy. And it, you know what I'm trying to say? We're so easy to compare. But really, the choice is up to us how we use what God gives us. And the most important thing to remember is that God is watching. This is what we forget so often, is God is watching how we use the money that we're given. And it's, you know, we lose that, that perspective because we don't realize that actually when God gives us things, it's a test. Because this life, life is a test. Because what we do in this life affects eternity. And so we've got to realize that actually we are on a journey and in our journey of life, God keeps bringing tests into our path because he wants us to grow in our character. He wants us to grow so that we become like him. And so whenever we do things and we grow to be like Christ, we are, as it were, sending on ahead the things, uh, uh, the, the, our money, as it were, our treasures. We're storing up treasure in heaven when we do this. Yes, God's not going to compare you to anyone else. God's not going to compare you to your wife, or to, to, to your husband, or to your children, or to your neighbor, or to your work colleague. He's going to ask you about you. He's interested in what you have that he's given you, and how you use that. Amen? So you can waste your money, you can spend your money, you can use it, you can invest it, but one day 
you are going to have to give an account. And verse 19 says this, after a long time, the master of the three servants returned to settle his accounts. This brings us to the third principle, the principle of accountability. In other words, one day God is going to do an audit. Yes, this isn't an inland revenue audit, okay, where you have to present your, your accounts to them. I want to say to you, this is an, an audit that God is going to do, and he has all the facts and the figures already. He, 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 he doesn't, he's not going to say, oh, what did you do with this and whatever. He's, not going, to, he's going to say, oh, I see that on that day, at that hour, or whatever, what we did with it. Amen? So we're going to have that. Everything we've ever done, whether it's with our time, or whether it's our money, or with anything that's in our life, God is going to want to us. To, we're going to have to give an account to God for the things that we have done. And of course, because God has made an investment in each of us, he's made an investment of gifts and abilities, he's given us time, he's given us energy, he's given us, you know, I mean, opportunities that he puts our way, that uh, the freedom that we have, the heritages that we might have, the intellect that we have, are all things that God uh, loans to us, that gives to us to use for him. But unfortunately, too often, we try to stockpile the things that we have. And, but life is not about the acquisition of things. Yes? <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard the phrase, he, he who, um, has the most, uh, who, who dies with the most toys wins. Yes? Have you heard that? Well, actually, it should say, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> okay? He doesn't win anything, actually, because he has to leave it all behind, yes? And so it's important that we do that. Jesus is watching us, what we do with that. In fact, on one occasion, Jesus goes into the temple and actually watches people, what they put into the temple. Romans 14 and verse 12 says this, each of us will give an account of himself to God. To God. <clears throat> you see, it's easy to be irresponsible, and so often, maybe for, for all of us at some stage in our life, we have been irresponsible. But irresponsibility can't last because if you continue to be irresponsible, you get yourself into a mess. In any area of life that you are irresponsible with, you will get into a, life, uh, into a problem. It always catches you in the end. For example, Britain is reeling in trillions of debt. It didn't get in that overnight, yes? But it's got into it, why? Because it's kept kicking the can down the road. And so many nations are doing the same, yes? Uh, some of the most greatest nations in the world are often in the verge of bankruptcy, yes? It's not long ago, I mean, we, we, when we were thinking of banks going bust, and we thought, oh, I can't believe it, this bank's gone bust, and that bank, the thought of a bank going bust just blew our mind, but then we realized there was countries, yes? Uh, Portugal and Italy and Greece and Spain were all countries that were on the verge of bankruptcy at one time. So I'm saying we live in that kind of world. Why? Because we overspend, because we don't, we're irresponsible. We think we can just keep on adding things to the credit card and getting away with it, yes? Verses 20 and 21, it says this. The man who received five talents, that's eight and a half million pounds, brought the other five, he'd gained another eight and a half million he had made, and he said, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Now that's some investment, isn't it? He's made, he's doubled it, 100% profit. The master, and of course in this case, the master is talking about God, is pleased He's pleased with what he's done with it, yes? Now, I don't know whether he invested in Google or Amazon or whatever it might have been, uh, whatever it was of their day, but he made some good, good decisions and, uh, and benefited from it. The second guy, it says there in verse 22, the servant who was given two talents of money also came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. Now see that I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. So he's done the same. Then he comes to the third guy. And the third guy's not done that well. Verse 24 says, The man who had received one talent came and said, Master, 
I knew that you're a hard man. So can you see that? How he's already, he's turned the tables. He's saying, well, you're a hard man. In other words, it's your fault. How many times do we pass the blame on to somebody else? When we get into debt, it's the government's fault or it's the council's fault or it's, so, it's always somebody else's fault. And it's not the fact that we've been overspending on a consistent basis over and over the time. And so it goes on, you've been harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid, obviously, of losing the money. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. Here's what belongs to you. Now, the master's reply is really profound and it really takes us by surprise because the master responds, you wicked, lazy servant. I don't know about you, but that really blows my mind to think that actually because he has not invested what he was given, that actually it's not just, well, you haven't done well, I'm not going to invest in you anymore, but he's actually told it that it's wicked and that he's a lazy servant. Why? Because he buried what had been given him. And we do the same so often, we bury the things that God has given us. And we do that generally because of fear. And there are all types of fears that we can have. We can have the fear of failure. We can have the fear of what will other people think. We can have all sorts of different fears. But they stop us from investing, from taking the risk, from stepping out in faith. And so we end up with a victim mentality when we do this. Yes, that people do it all the time um, around us. Yeah? People say, oh, got into debt. And say, well, who made you put all them things on your credit card? Or who made you go out and buy that brand new house or that brand new car or whatever it might be? <clears throat> and so it's important for us to, to realize that. Proverbs 19 and verse 3 says this. People ruin themselves by their own stupid actions and then blame the Lord. Yes, Unfortunately, that is so often to do. Verse 27, he says, you should have at least put my money, the master says, in the bank so I could make some interest. In other words, I, you should have done something with it so that I, I had a way of getting some, uh, some interest. The fourth principle brings us on to is the principle of responsibility. The responsibility of wisdom, we must wisely use God's money. God expects us to use what he's given us, not to hoard it, not to sit on it, not just to kind of hide it, but to realize that money is a tool. It's not meant to be stockpiled. It's meant to be used. And unfortunately, too many of us, we are in the stockpiling mentality and try to get as much as we, as we can. And so I think it's important for us to realize that this is serious. And Jesus gives this illustration for us to realize that how we use it will be uh, important. Now, he says he, he calls him wicked. I don't know about you, but when I think of, when I think of wicked, <clears throat> I think of murder or I think of rape or you think of kind of slavery and abuse and you think of all those kind of things, don't you? And yet here, we have got financial mismanagement classed as wickedness and being a lazy servant. I think that really should make us sit up and think about this area in our life. Why? Because it's a test, and God wants us to pass the test, yes? And he wants us to use what we've got. It's so often, we've got to realize that not using what God has given us is inexcusable in God's eyes. He wants us to use it and to use, uh, use it, it well. And uh, God has done that. So let me bring us to <clears throat> um, why we so often don't use what we've got. It's often because of fear, but it's often because of our selfishness. Um, and, but I want to say to you, we lose our joy when all we're trying to do is to acquire and to gain things for ourselves. If your world revolves around you and just yours, it's a small world. And it will cause you to have, to be, to be sad. It will cause you to be unhappy. But if you want to be joy, full of joy, the most joyful people in the world are the people who invest uh, what God has given them. People who, uh, who know that whether that's finances, whether that's their time, whether it's their talents, whatever it might be, they think of everything that they have and think, how can I use this for God? They are the happiest people in the world 
because they're not looking at it as themselves. They've got a bigger picture and a bigger understanding of that. And maybe you're sat there, sat here today, and you think to yourself, I'd love to use my talents. I'd used to love, use my gifts and my abilities. How can I use them in the church? How can, I, how can I know what they are? Well, we do a ministry course. And if you'd like to sign up to that, um, then just put it on the card that's in front of you. Just put it on there. I'd love to do the ministry course, and we will add your name to the ministry course and, uh, so that you can find out the things and learn the gifts and abilities the way that God has shaped you is so important. The fifth principle is the principle of faith, the principle of courage, the principle of stepping out. In other words, if we want to be successful in our financial life, we need to move against the things that we fear. We've got to face our fears. Now, whatever it is in life, whatever it is that you've got a talent for, there's always a fear um, attached to it. So in other words, if you've um, if you're got the talent to, for, for business, there's going to be the fear of failure. If you've got the talent for singing, there's going to be the, 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 the fear of, will people like my voice? And Do you know what I mean? There's always kind of fears attached to the things that we are, that we are good at. And uh, we've got to face those fears if we are going uh, to really become what God wants us uh, to do. And the, the reason for that is, is that to apply God's principles so often... They require us to think counter-culturally. A lot of things in our culture are counter the kingdom of God, are counter what God has for us. But they always require faith. Always require you to step out in faith with that. And so we do. We, 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 we worry about them. Could I do that? What about this? But I found that the issue is always to, to get on board and to think the little by little principle. Better to do something and to do a little bit because as you use what little you have, you start to grow and you start to add to it. Yes, and it becomes, it becomes greater. So all the little adds up, doesn't it? So we try to operate and we talk, teach uh, the 101080 principle or the 108010 principle, whichever way you want to do it, and that is that, that you save at 10%, that you give 10%, and that you live on 80%. Um, and and that, that is a, a good way to, to live. And so we've we found that. Now, um, so for, for Kath and I, and I'll talk about in future, uh, future weeks, some of the ways that we've, we've implemented that and the ways that that, that has helped us and, and uh, made a change <clears throat> in our life. But it is important for us to think long term. So in other words, if you want to lose weight... You don't lose 80 pounds in a week. Yes, but if you do little by little and you're consistent and persistent to it, you will lose that weight. And so it's that that God's looking for in each of us, that we use what we've got and invest what we have because it will grow and it will become more than what we've got. And the, the sixth principle is the principle of application. In other words, use it or lose it. It's a universal thing, doesn't matter what it is in life. If you don't exercise, you're going to lose your muscles. If you don't practice, you're going to lose the skills that you're in. You know, whatever it is, uh, if you don't use it, you're going uh, to lose it. And so God is looking at that and he's saying, can I trust you with more? And the point of this, this parable that Jesus is saying is, is, if you use wisely what God has given you, God will give you more. God will bless you more. Not always with finances, but you're always blessed in, in, in many ways, and I can assure you that. So the question, of course, is, is if you're in lack in any area of your life, whether that's with your time or with your finances or with your energy, or with your health, whatever it is, then what you need to do is you need to give to God that, that which you're requiring more of because God will always multiply it. Amen? <clears throat> we sow. What we sow is what we reap, and we'll look at that at one of the... Uh, one of the uh, weeks, we'll, uh, we'll look at the whole aspect of uh, God's exponential growth plan that he has put into place for you and for, and for I. And the last point is the principle of compensation. God will reward us for good money management. Yes, because money and our use of money is the acid test of faithfulness, God is looking at how we handle our money to see whether or not we are trustworthy. Because if we're not trustworthy with money here on earth, how can we be trustworthy with eternal treasures? 
And God is looking at how we respond to what we have here as to how we are. And so he's, he wants to, to bless us with that and we get rewarded when we use it well. And uh, he, he, he rewards us in three ways that you can, uh, uh, <clears throat> that you'll see verse 21. It says rewards with affirmation. Well done, you good and faithful servant. With promotion, he says, now I'll put you in charge of, of, uh, of more things. And then celebration, come and share God's happiness. Let me ask you a basic question. Are you going to be at the party? Because there's going to be a party that God is going to throw in heaven for each one of us. And it depends what we do with what God has given us as to how we will be at that party. And the biggest question, of course, is that God has given us Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What you do with Jesus is the number one question in your life. And maybe today you said, I've not made that decision. Well, today you can make that decision today. And you can say, today, I want to invest my life in that which is eternal. I want God to have my life. You want to, if you would love to do that, the card in front of you again, just put it down. I'd love to give my life to Jesus and we will get in touch with you and have a conversation with you and follow on and give you some resources and materials that will help you in your journey with the Lord. Yes, and I'm just going to pray in a moment, and you may want to pray with that. For the rest of us, uh, that maybe that have already given your life to Jesus, the question then is, is have you given God and recognized to God that he is the owner? And as we sing this final song, I want you, whether you're to stand or, or kneel or whatever you might want to do, I just want you to, to just in your heart to represent that heart to God, to say, God, I recognize that I am owned by you. Everything I have belongs to you. I offer it again to you, Lord, and I recognize that you are the one who is due it. So when, I, when I'm blessed, I realize, Lord, it's your blessing. I think that's what we really need to do. Yes? So it, it, it's up to you. How, how we respond to what God is saying to us today is up to each It's a choice. Amen? Um, but I pray that today that you realize that there is bigger things at broad in how we handle our money than just the fact that whether we are in debt or not in debt, that it actually that there's bigger spiritual issues that are, that are at stake when how we use the finances that, that, that we have. Amen. For those of you that would like to give your life to Christ, just pray something simple like this. Dear Lord Jesus, today... I want to follow you. Today, I recognize that you are the one who has given me everything that I have. But I recognize today that there is something missing in my life. I recognize today that I've had a wrong perspective on life. And today, I want to accept you into my life. I want to make you my boss. I want you to be my master, to be my owner, so that everything I have can be used for your glory, so that my life has meaning, so that I can be invited to the greatest party the universe has ever seen, so that I can know that I have a future in heaven and that I can live for eternity with blessings, and that in this life I can know what it is to live without stress and worry and debt. I ask this in Jesus' lovely name. Amen.